Welcome to the Supernatural Life Podcast with Chad Gonzalez, a podcast all about helping you connect with God so you can manifest God to the world. Now, here's your host, Pastor Chad Gonzalez. Hey friends, this is Chad Gonzalez. I want to welcome you to this episode of the Supernatural Life Podcast. It's our goal to help you connect with God so you can manifest God to your world. Very excited about all the things that are coming up. You know, we just finished up the first half of 2021 and just very much looking forward to this latter half. Some great things taking place. First of all, just want to let you know about our Books Around the World project. We've just gotten Possessors of Life translated into Urdu. We've got a minister's conference and a miracle crusade that we have taking place in September in uh, Lahore, Pakistan. And so we got 1,000 copies of Possessors of Life in Urdu that's going to be given away to the pastors at this conference. So very excited about this newest translation. For those of you who would be interested, if you'd like to help in sponsoring some of these books for the pastors, our total project cost on this was $3,900. And so if you'd like to be a part of the Books Around the World project, you can go to chadgonzalez.com and go to the Dream Team page and be a part of that. Uh, Speaking of Dream Team, if you're not a partner with us, we would love to have you partner up with us. We're doing this month for anybody who decides to partner with us. It doesn't matter what the amount, whether it's $5, $1, $100, whatever. If you partner with us, we're going to send you a free copy of an alternate reality, and uh, we'll get that out to you. Also, we're excited to announce that we just signed a book agreement with Destiny Image for a brand new book that will come out next year for the fall of 2022. It's going to be a brand new book based on John chapter 17 and Jesus's prayer, his prayer for us, and which he's talking about his union with the Father and praying for us to have that very same union. So we're pumped about that book. It's actually going to be a part of the Healing Academy curriculum for some things we have coming out next year. So real excited about that. And then lastly, I want to let you know, if you are in the Louisiana area, we're going to be in Donaldsville, Louisiana. It's about an hour outside of New Orleans. We're going to be there Sunday, July 18th at Word of Life Church. So if you live in the area, we would love for you to come and join us. Say hi to us. We're expecting some great miracles to take place in that service. So lots of good things going on. And we've got some other things that we'll share with you next month that God's doing for us and through us. So just so privileged and honored to be used by him and, and be a part of what he's doing in these last great days. Hey, this month, I want to talk to you about our consciousness of God, our awareness of God. This is something that the the Lord's really been putting on my heart and leading me more into over this last year. It's been something I've been teaching on more in the healing conferences that we've been doing. This consciousness, this awareness of God, it's very, very important because, you know, the smarter we become, the easier it is to rely on that knowledge. I know that, you know that to be true. And, you know, we're living in a church age where we know more scripture than any other generation. And yet as a whole, we're seeing less experiences of God in our church services, in our conferences, and in just our day-to-day lives. We're seeing less. We know more, but we're seeing less. And I don't know about you, but for me, that's a problem. And instead of just sticking my head in the sand and acting like everything's okay, I refuse to do that. I refuse to do that. And it's just frustrating because we look around and we have people talking about revival and preaching on steps and keys for revival. We have faith conferences on how to move a mountain and how to be a water walker, but there's no revival. There's no miracles. The mountains are staring back in our faces and the people preaching about walking on the water are in reality still sitting in the boat. So what's the deal? Well, faith without works is dead, but really faith without fellowship, it's dead too. Listen to what I just said there. Faith without works, it's dead. Yes, we've got scripture for that. But also, faith without fellowship, it's dead too. It's a fake faith if it's not based on fellowship. We've got our formulas, and we all know those formulas. But fellowship is not in the faith formula. So I want to spend some time and just, you know, strip away, strip away the things that we know. Take it all aside. And let's just go back to the Bible. Go back to the very beginning. Look at the way God started this thing. 
You know, when God created Adam, just think about this. When God created Adam, the very first thing that Adam saw was God. He didn't see a book. God didn't put a book in front of Adam's face. He put himself in front of Adam. Adam began to learn about God. He began to experience God face to face. It was fellowship. It was about presence. It was about right here, right now, seeing, hearing, experiencing. This was God's plan for man, that man would experience him and fellowship with him, that we'd be very, very best friends. These encounters with God. The first thing that Adam saw was God, not a book. Notice that God's plan A, his first plan, his initial plan, his primary plan was fellowship with man, seeing, hearing, experiencing, knowing his presence, not by data, not by facts, but by experience, but by experience. That was God's plan. And isn't it interesting that even after Adam sinned, check it out, he's still hearing and he's still seeing. Even after Adam's sin, he's a sinner now. He's died spiritually, and yet he still hears God's footsteps. He still hears God's footsteps in the garden, and he hears God cry out for him. Genesis chapter 3 verse 8 says, They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid themselves, and the Lord God called out to them. He called out to them. They heard God walking in the garden, and yet they were sinners. You see, this shows us the reality of being a spirit being, that even spiritually dead, even without the life of God in your spirit, you can still be spiritually in tune to spiritual things. You see, Adam's consciousness or his awareness of God was not based on how much scripture he knew. His awareness of God, his consciousness of God, It had been cultivated by seeing and hearing and experiencing God. And he was so aware of God that even though he was dead spiritually, he wasn't connected to God, he still heard him. He still saw him. That'll make your mind go tilt a little bit. Your religious mind, our religious mindsets go go a little haywire, go a little crazy because that doesn't fit with our, our way of thinking as a Christian. Here's Adam Adam and Eve, and they hear God walking in the garden, and yet spiritually dead. And yet we see this continuing to go on uh, throughout Scripture when we get to a guy named Moses. You know, you see when God introduces Moses uh, to himself, again, he doesn't introduce a book to Moses. He introduces himself. It was about presence. At no point in Moses' life does God put a book in his face. When Moses was hungry to know God, Moses put a tent outside the camp. He called it the tent of meeting. He said, this is where I'm going to meet with God. And the Bible says that God met him and spoke to him face to face as a man speaks to his own friend. And yet, always remember, Moses was a sinner. I mean, this guy was a former murderer. He'd killed somebody. He's a sinner. He's got righteousness on credit. He's not a child of God. He's not born again, not blood washed, blood bought, not seated at the right hand of God. He's not in Christ. He's not a tongue talker. No, he didn't have these things. He didn't have knowledge of the scripture that we, that we have. But what he did know is something most of us do not know. He knew the presence of God. He was very aware of God, conscious of God. A great consciousness, great awareness of God. Then you can go on to people like Elijah and Elisha. You know, they didn't have the Bible that we do. But they were operating from the presence of God. They were operating from consciousness of who God was and who he, who he is, this consciousness of God with them. They used the anointing purposely. They used it intentionally. They used it confidently. It was just like a mechanic using his tools. They knew how to work the anointing. It was based off their revelation and their understanding of these things that they had gotten from the Lord. I mean, think about what Elijah and Elisha did. They called up fire out of heaven. They multiplied food. They raised the dead. They parted waters. They healed the sick. And these guys were sinners. They weren't saved. They weren't filled with the Holy Ghost. No, they didn't have all these things that we have. They weren't a child of God. They were a sinner. 
You have Moses parts the Red Sea. You have Moses, you know, operating in the anointing and causing the plagues to come. You have Moses doing all of these things, hitting even in, in Moses' disobedience, he causes water to come out of a rock. God told him to speak to it. And instead, Moses grabs his staff and hits it twice and causes water to come out more than enough to take care of millions of people and animals. This was all about presence. This wasn't about a formula. They didn't have the scriptures that we have. They didn't have knowledge of the scriptures. They didn't have scriptures memorized. They didn't have scriptures that they could confess. They didn't have all these things that they could confess while they're sitting there and calling fire out of heaven and raising the dead. They weren't there confessing scriptures. What it was is that they knew God. They knew his presence. They knew the anointing by experience, by encounters. There was fellowship there. Even with Jesus, Jesus makes this statement in John chapter 14, verses 19 through 21. He's talking to the disciples and he's talking to them about salvation. And he says, on that day, the day of salvation, he said, you will know that I am in you, you are in me, I am in the Father. And he said, I will reveal myself, I'll manifest myself to you. This would make me believe that we should be experiencing more in our lives, more of him in our lives, more seeing and more hearing. But the reason that we aren't is because we've been told you can't. But the problem is, is that Jesus said you can Jesus is the one that said, on the day of salvation, get ready, boys. On the day of salvation, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me, and I will manifest myself to you. Jesus was telling us that on the day of salvation, get ready to have encounters with me. Get ready to have encounters with God. Get ready for the spiritual things to explode in your life. You know, when Jesus was spending his hours of prayer with God, in the mountain and in the wilderness. He wasn't just pouring over scripture. God was showing him things and telling him things. Jesus made this statement numerous times throughout the book of John. He said, I only say what I hear the Father say. I only do what I see the Father do. John chapter 5 and verse 20, Jesus said this. He said, the Father will show me even greater things than these just so you can marvel. Just so you'll marvel. Just so you will go, wow. Here, Jesus is letting us in on a secret that the foundation of all that he did, the miracles and signs and wonders that we see in Jesus' life and in his ministry, it came from this, hearing and seeing and then just doing it, obeying what he heard and obeying what he saw. What you see here is fellowship. These weren't things that he was just picking out of Scripture. Now, yeah, we see it's very easy to see when you, when you look at the life of Elijah and Elisha. Now, we know Jesus knew the law. He knew the law and the prophets. Now, remember, Elijah and Elisha, they didn't know the prophets. They were the prophets. These things that we read with Moses, Moses didn't have these things. I mean, Moses is telling us these things afterwards, right? Moses didn't have the scriptures like we do. Elijah and Elisha didn't have the scriptures like we do. Even Jesus, I mean, he had the law. He had the prophets. We can see very easily how he was inspired by the things that Elijah and Elisha did. But Jesus is telling us, there's things that we don't even know of that the Father is going to show me. Things that he's going to show me. They're going to be brand new, fresh revelation he's going to show me. And, and what I see from him and what I hear from him, I'm going to do those things. Jesus was letting us know that fellowship was a very, very necessary ingredient. He said, I do what the Father shows me. I do what I see. I say what I hear. So what we begin to find out, you know, if we look at our Bible, the purpose of our Bible, it wasn't just to make us smart. And unfortunately, we've, we've seen this happen all over again in our modern church where we are a very, very smart people. We're very, very smart Christians. We know lots of scripture. We can, we can confess and quote lots of scriptures about healing, and we can confess and quote lots of scriptures about finances, and we can confess and quote all these scriptures. But if we're not getting results, if we're not seeing the results of Jesus, and yet we have all this knowledge, then something's wrong. The purpose of the Bible was not to make us smart. It was to help bring us back into a fellowship with God of hearing and seeing, of experiencing the spiritual and walking in a constant awareness of God. 
You know, the Bible's full of stories of individuals that had experiences with God, but it wasn't just so that we could talk about them. It was for those stories to inspire us to have our very own. These stories, they're taught in children's church. You know, David, you know, fighting Goliath and, and Elijah and Elisha, you know, doing all these wonderful miracles and Moses doing all these wonderful miracles. They're taught in our children's church and they're taught in our adult services from the standpoint of the awesomeness and the greatness of God or the individual having faith in God. But why not add the perspective that these Old Testament people showed us that at the very least, what we can have as New Testament people. Why aren't we teaching these things also from the standpoint of, hey, we can do these things too, and even greater because, you know, they weren't even saved. And you could say, well, but that doesn't seem possible. Yeah, but listen to what Jesus said. Jesus said in John 14, 12, he said, whatever I did, you will do also, and even greater works. And we know that under the new covenant, we have a better covenant established upon better promises. And we don't have just the Holy Spirit with us. We have the Spirit of God in us. We have so many advantages, so many advantages over the old covenant people. They didn't have anything that we don't have. We've got it all plus, plus a whole lot more than what they had. But the one area that they are just tearing us up, I mean, the one area in which they are showing uh, under the old covenant, the, these heroes of the faith, the one thing that they, they knew far greater than most of us in, a, in the modern church today, they knew God. Oh, yeah, we know our scriptures. but We know our scriptures. I mean, we can rattle them off. <laughs> I mean, it's almost like a, a robot. We're very... We can get very mechanical, like a machine, like a computer, and just rattle these things off because we're so smart. But when it comes to producing, we fall very, very short. And it's not because of equipment. It's because of awareness. It's because of awareness. Why are we allowing the Old Testament sinners to outdo and outshine the church of Jesus Christ? That's my question for the church today. That's my question. Why are we allowing the Old Testament sinners to outshine and outdo the very church of Jesus Christ today? Why are we allowing that to happen? Why are we acting like it's okay? Why are we satisfied with where we're at? Why are we making excuses? Because that's what I hear. I don't know about you, but that's what I hear all over the place. I'm hearing excuse after excuse after excuse as to why we're not seeing these things. And one of the things I just keep hearing from people, and I'm getting really frustrated as well, we just need to get more word in us. Well, friend, how much more word do you need? Because the problem with that statement is the Old Testament dudes, they didn't have the word. Think about that. They didn't have the scripture that you and I have. They didn't have the understanding of who Jesus was and what Jesus was going to do. They didn't have that understanding. They didn't have union with the Father like you and I have. But they knew God. There was fellowship. There was awareness. There was a very consciousness of God with them and God for them. There was a consciousness of God. None of the Old Testament heroes of faith got their faith from reading the Bible. They got it from hearing and they got it from seeing. The things that we read are the result of their hearing and their seeing. Friends, faith comes by hearing the word of God, yes, but it's hearing the rhema word of God, the spoken word of God. And that implies fellowship. That implies and lets us know there's got to be a consciousness, an awareness of God to hear from him. We have elevated knowledge of scripture above knowledge of him. Listen to that. We have elevated knowledge of Scripture above knowledge of Him. Now look, I am not bashing the Bible. Understand, I mean, I read the Word of God. I cherish my, my Bibles. I've got lots of different translations. I cherish the Word of God. Thank God for the written Word of God. It is the Word of God. 
inspired by the Holy Ghost, written down by the men of old. Thank God for the written word of God. And we should read it daily. We should study it daily. And I do. I spend a great amount of time studying my Bible. But friend, listen to me. Studying our Bible should not be a substitute for having a consciousness and awareness of God in our daily life. And that's what we have done. We have substituted the written word of God for a consciousness of God. Us using our Bible to replace the consciousness of God, that wasn't the plan of God. Remember, the purpose of our Bible was to lead us into a fellowship with God. It was to lead us into an awareness of God. It was to lead us into a consciousness of God. This is why Jesus was so successful. Did you notice the things? If you go through the book of John, notice the things that Jesus is constantly saying. The Father's with me. The Father who sent me, he's always with me. He's never left me alone. The Father who's on the inside of me, he's the one who does the works. The Father, the Father, the Father with me, the Father in me, the Father through me. Jesus was very, very, very conscious and aware of God with him. To such a degree that when Jesus would encounter some hard times, some trials, some tribulations, some tests, he didn't have to go and fast and pray for 21 days to hear from God as to what to do. Even in those times when Jesus exerted his authority and didn't get a result the first time, he was so conscious of God, so aware of God, you don't see him have to go off and fast and pray to find out what to do. He heard immediately what to do. You know, when Jesus was in the gatherings and he was ministering to the madman there, the man that was possessed with those thousands of devils, and Jesus tells the devil to come out and nothing happens. You know, Jesus immediately hears from the Holy Ghost and asks the demon what his name is. And that's the only time that we see Jesus ask the demon what its name is. But what does man do? What, what do we do? Well, we make a doctrine out of that. And so now you have people with these so-called deliverance ministries. And, and what are they doing? They're asking all the demons, what's your name? What's your name? What's your name? And yet we only see Jesus do it one time. Well, why did he do it that one time? Well, it wasn't because he saw it written down in the Bible or anywhere. He heard it from the Holy Ghost. And I know people will get all upset and get offended by talking like this. But friends, you know this to be true. Again, we're not putting down the Bible. But think about this. You know this to be true. The Bible doesn't tell you who to marry and what job to take and what house to buy and, and where to go and, and launch your ministry or where to go and start your business. The Bible doesn't tell you that. How do you get those answers? By hearing, being led by the Holy Spirit, by hearing from Him, by Him showing you things. How does that come? It comes from fellowship. And what, what leads you into that fellowship? The written Word of God. It's a starting point right there to lead you into this fellowship of hearing and seeing where you have this fellowship with God, this consciousness, this awareness of God, so that wherever you are, in the marketplace, in the store, in your place of business, you're so conscious of God, so aware of God, that God's more real to you than the clothes that are on your body, that God's more real to you than the person that's sitting across the table from you, so that in any situation, anything that arises, no matter how severe it may be, that you're so conscious of Him, that you hear from Him and know exactly what to do, exactly what to say in any given situation, in any given circumstance. Why? Because we're cultivating an awareness of God. If you and I want to be major players in this last great move of God, it's going to require us to have a very great consciousness and awareness of God. Not just knowing Scripture, not just, just, not just having Scripture memorized. Because if it was all based on the Scriptures that we have memorized and the Scriptures that we know, I mean, my goodness, we'd be seeing revival and this great awakening taking place every living second. It's not about the Scriptures that you know. It's about the God that you know. It's not about the Scriptures that you know. It's about knowing the voice who spoke the Scriptures. We've got to get back to this thing of what Christianity was all about a relationship and a fellowship with God. That's what it was all about. How do I know that? Because we see it in the very beginning with Adam. 
And what Adam lost out on, Jesus came to provide that and then make it even better. Jesus came not only so we could become one with God, but also so we could have this fellowship with God. That's what walking by faith is all about. Not that we're going through life, you know, like we're walking in the dark and got our hands out and and trying to touch and feel and try to figure some things out. No, the life of faith is living a life based on the presence of God. The things you don't see and don't hear with your physical eyes and ears, but you pick up and you see with your spiritual eyes and you pick up and you hear with your spiritual ears. Faith is living by the spiritual things. And it all comes back to consciousness, awareness. How conscious are you of God? How conscious are you of God? You know, Smith Wigglesworth made this statement. I so loved it the very first time I read it. He made this statement, and I lived by this. He said, if you're less aware of God right now than what you were five minutes ago, you've backslidden. That's a powerful statement. If you're less aware of God right now than what you were five minutes ago, you've backslidden. See, we talk about backsliding, we talk about sin, but friend, the backsliding takes place way before the action that you do with your body. You start slipping backwards when you're less aware of God right now than what you were one minute ago or 10 minutes ago. You and I should always be progressing in our awareness and our consciousness of God. Yes, we study the scripture. Yes, we memorize scripture. Yes, we confess scripture, but do not allow those things to take the place of a consciousness and awareness of God. They never were to take the place. And yet, unfortunately, that is what has happened in our modern church. But this is one thing that I am really working on, endeavoring to get better at, because I know it is a must and that I have to be aware of him. I want to be in a place where there, and I'm not there yet. I'm not saying I'm there yet. But I want to be in a place where I am constantly, continually, 24-7 aware of him. More aware of him than my spouse. More aware of him than the person next to me. More aware of him than the clothes that are on my back. I want him to be the greatest reality in my life. Because the more real he is to me, the greater and easier I can manifest him to the world. We could spend a whole lot of time on this and we'll get into it more uh, later on in the year. This is just something that's been burning on the inside of me because I know it's where we're headed. This is where we're headed. Just looking at the life of Jesus, the way that he lived, it was all centered. It was all based. It was all founded on presence, knowing the presence of God, operating from the presence of God, being aware of the presence of God. For in the presence, that's where we see, that's where we hear. Thank God for the Word of God, but do not allow it to be a substitute for a consciousness of God in your daily life. Friends, hey, if you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, make sure and do that. We're seeing great growth in our social media, and we're uploading new videos there and some new teachings there as well. If you haven't been to the website in a while, go check it out, chadgonzalez.com. We've got some great things there, and you can also become a Dream Team partner with us if you haven't already. Praise the Lord. Hey, be checking out our upcoming meetings. We'd love to see you there. Love to meet you, shake your hand, give you a hug. We'll look forward to talking to you next month in the next episode of the Supernatural Live podcast. Remember that in Christ, we always win.